I think the topic of today's talk, the proof of God's existence or does God exist or is there a God, is something which whoever turned up and whoever didn't turn up is going to be something that is bugging a lot of people, plaguing their minds, making them wonder, because indeed there is so much attached to this question, does God exist? So many implications that come from it. So many things, so many consequences, so many implications. And indeed it really stems from this fundamental aspect of the human being, is that we are constantly asking ourselves, and perhaps not consciously, it's not something we go around saying, well, you know, why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? What is the reason for my existence? It's not always a conscious thing. But it subconsciously it is going on all the time. Subconsciously, at least, everybody wants to know, is dying to know, the reason and the purpose for their existence. Indeed, if we were to look at ourselves and to look at the world around us, we were to look at the things and the objects that we use, and if I was to say to you, well, what is the purpose of this cup? Everybody could tell me, we know what the purpose of this cup is. If I was to ask you, what are the purpose of your shoes? You can tell me my shoes are to keep my feet warm and to protect them from the, you know, the, the stones and these things. What is the purpose of your watch? What is the purpose of the sun? What is the purpose of the moon? Most people would have an idea of the purpose of the existence of these things. Yet if we were to ask mankind, human beings, what is the purpose of your existence? For what reason do you exist? most people would not be able to give an answer. They would look blank. They would become confused. They might become angry. And so you say to them, we could say to ourselves, that in our eyes, the shoes we walk on have more purpose than we do. Because our shoes have a purpose, but we don't have no purpose. Double negative, sorry. The shoes have a purpose, but we don't have any purpose. The watch we wear, it has a purpose, but what is our purpose? We don't know. So we find even enshrined in British law that property has more value than person. Why? Because property has a meaning. It has a purpose. But human beings, what are we for anyway? We don't know. Why are we here? What are we for? We don't know. So this question of does God exist? This questioning is there a God? It's something very significant concerning this confusion that mankind has about the reality or the purpose for which we exist. Why are we here? What am I supposed to do with myself as a human being? And before I go any further into the talk, I want to sort out a definition. Because if you're going to ask this question, does God exist, or we're going to try and prove whether there's a God or not, we have to ask ourselves, well, what do we mean by God? What is God. What is a God? And a God in the end is what you worship. Your God is the thing that you believe to be the directing creator. Put it more simply, God is the thing that you believe will give you what you want. Your God is the thing that you believe will give you what you want. And religion is the path that you take in order to worship or pursue that God. Let me give you an example. Some people believe that by reaching a particular position in society, reaching a particular high status, perhaps becoming a committee member of the student union, or whatever it may be, they believe that by attaining this position, they will have the peace, security, popularity, happiness, etc, etc, that they desire. So this is their God. They believe that attaining this position will give them what they want. And in order to achieve that position, in order to achieve that God, in order to get there, what do they do? They have a whole set of worships, rituals, rites, a means of getting there. So if you want to become the president of the student union, you can be sure that you have to hold certain views and not hold certain other views. You have to dress in a certain way, perhaps, talk in a certain way, perhaps, 
Mm-hmm. You have to eat and drink in a certain way. You have certain friends and, certain, and you don't have certain other friends. The same if you want to reach a higher position in society. The same thing applies. You have to talk in a certain way, dress in a certain way, drive a certain type of car. And when it comes to dinner time, I know because I used to, this, my family used to be like this, or still are. You have everything laid out in a particular way. You have your red wine glass, and your white wine glass, and your water glass, and your liqueur glass, and you have your, your pudding spoon, and your soup spoon, and your fish knife, and your main course knife, and your fish uh, fork, and etc., etc., all laid out in the exact specific way dictated by culture, tradition, whatever it may be, the people who follow this religion. And one was the type, the person who puts the water glass where the red wine glass should be. Because, wait a minute, this guy, he's not clued on. These people, they don't know. They don't know how to set the table properly. So we find this is a religion. This is a religion. This is a worship. They have a God. The God is social standing. The things that go with it is the religion. Or an idol worshipper, for example, they worship the idol, they sacrifice to it, they perform certain rituals, believing that by doing this, they will get whatever it is, the male child they want, or the cross, or the rain will come, or whatever it is. So they have their God, the object they believe will give them what they want, and they have the, the religion that evolves around that God. And when we understand God and religion in these terms, then we understand that everybody has a God or even a multitude of gods. And everybody is religious. Everybody follows a religion. Because what is a religion in the end but a way of life? The way you lead your life. And you lead your life orientated around certain ideas and concepts and beliefs that you have. So even then we find someone says, I'm not religious. But someone says, I'm not religious. Actually, this is not true. They are religious. They're religiously not religious. Their belief is, of course, now, that religion is the, source of, the, the cause of all sorrow and all woe and all misery. So, people who follow religion, that's bad. So, their religion is not to follow religion. And they religiously avoid doing what religious people do. And it has its own behavior, patterns, it has its own rites, it has its own rituals, it has its own whatever. So, the question that we have to really get to, is that whether you're a communist and an atheist, a scientist, a humanist, a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, a Buddhist, a Taoist, whatever you may be. The point in the end is the question we have to ask ourselves is not so much is there a God or does God exist, but rather out of the multitudes of gods that there are and out of the multitudes of things that people worship and out of the multitudes of religions which is the one or the ones worthy of following? Which God is worthy of your worship? This is the real question. Because worship is natural to man. Mankind worship is part of his nature, part of her nature, part of the nature of human beings to worship. It's unavoidable for us. So the question comes now, what is the, the proper light? the proper world view? What are the proper concepts that I should hold? What what is the thing that will really give me what I want? Is it sex, drugs, rock and roll, money, position, power, wealth? What are the things that will really give me what I want? So we find now that the thing that we call in Islam the Kalima or the saying that makes you a Muslim, or that brings you into Islam, in Arabic, which I started with, La ilaha illallah, or Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. This means that I testify that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah, which means the one God. So this is something very important. Because this kalima, this saying of the Muslims, La ilaha illallah, starts with a negation. It starts with a negation. La ilaha, that there is no God, or there is no object worthy of worship. And then it goes on, in Allah, except Allah. And this is the methodology we find established both by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, Allah the Creator in the Qur'an, and through the example of His Prophet Muhammad, and through all the Prophets as well. That they began their teaching by pointing out to people and illustrating to them the falsity 
of the gods that they worship beside the one God. But why their gods were false gods, whatever they may be. And why the religion was a false religion, whatever it may be. But before we actually move on to that, we have to ask another question. An important one. When we as human beings are looking at the world, and we're looking at ourselves and we're trying to figure out what is all this about, why am I here, what, what am I doing, what's the point of life, how many times do you say that, what is life all about, what's the point of it all? When you actually stop just saying it out of desperation and you actually sit down or stand up or whatever you do and you think about it and you start using your mind and you start using your faculties that you've got in order to try and understand really what this is all about. What means as human beings can we use in order to determine which of these gods is worthy of worship, which religion is worth following? And there's many things we have. We have philosophy, we have science, we have mysticism, we have monasticism, we have you know, meditation, you, one can take hallucinogenic drugs. We're going to say, what is the means by which we as human beings can understand the reality of the purpose of our existence? What means do we use? Do we use science? Do we use philosophy? Do we have to take magic mushrooms? What do we do? Do we put all the different religions in a hat and pick out one and say, this is the one for me? Do we just follow what our forefathers taught us? We just do what our mum and dad said? My mum and dad are Muslim, so I'm a Muslim. My mum and dad are Jew, so I'm a Jew. He's a capitalist, so I'm a capitalist. Is that it? Is this the means by which we decide, we determine? So we understand as human beings, we should understand that most of these avenues are not open to the ordinary everyday people. For example, not everybody can be a scientist. Not everybody can be a philosopher. Not everybody can go and sit in a monastery or just give up their life and give up everything and go and sit in the woods, okay, and meditate or whatever until so-called enlightenment comes to them. Because near everybody is busy with their everyday life, just trying to live, just trying to exist, trying to feed themselves and feed their kids and feed their wife, etc., etc. Or the wife trying to feed the man or whatever it may be. So we find, actually, that there is a faculty which every human being can use, that we all have in common, whether he is the Eskimo, or the man in the jungle, or the person living in the desert, the Aborigine, or us in the so-called civilized Western world, we all have a shared set of common perceptions of reality. We all have a set of things that we understand because we're human beings, because of the reality of our humanity. We all of us look at the world in a certain way and perceive things in, certain, in a certain way, but it's all the same, common to us. In fact, it's called common sense. This faculty of common sense, if you want us to look at it and research it, you'll find that we have this, we share this together. All of us have this common sense, this common perception and way of observing things. And it's this that gets us by every minute and every day of our life. And when someone does something wrong, most of the time you find saying, but he hasn't got any common sense. If he used his common sense, he wouldn't be in this position, or she wouldn't be in this position. So it's this faculty that you use every minute of every day to get by. Why should we drop it when it comes to deciding which God is worthy of worship and which religion is the true religion to follow? Why should we suddenly abandon it? Why should we believe that what a religion is, and this is, a, this is what you find some people saying, Graham Greene, for example. He says, I believe in Catholicism because it doesn't make any sense. And it has, like, religion has to be mystical. It, has, it just somehow has to not make sense to be religion. But why? Why drop these faculties? Why stop using your mind, your reason, your common sense when it comes to this most important of things? It is, in the end, the most important thing because it is the foundation of your life. Your life is built on the way you perceive things. Whatever you do, whatever you say, the way you are, the way you behave is built upon that foundation. And this is the exact thing we find that Allah, Allah meaning, by the way, is an Arabic word. It comes from Al-Ilah, okay? Al-Ilah, which means the, Al means the, Ilah means the object worthy of worship. The object worthy of worship, Allah, the creator who made everything, who sustains everything, who brought it into existence and will bring it out of existence, etc., etc. This is what Allah means. So, please, if I use Allah and God, interchangeably, I hope we're understanding and we'll understand even more at the end, inshallah, good willing, what I mean. So, 
So, this is what Allah uses in the Qur'an. The book of the Muslims, which we believe is the speech of the creator of the heavens and the earth, his words, and in the Qur'an, he uses this methodology, he appeals to this quality amongst mankind, aqal, which we can loosely translate as common sense. So we find that in this Qur'an, there are stories, there are parables, there are phrases, there are sayings, there are means by which He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is encouraging mankind to direct their common sense towards looking at the world, towards looking at themselves, towards looking at the things that they worship, in order to establish with them, with us, certainly, definitely, without any doubt, that He alone is the one worthy of worship. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through some of these parables, some of these sayings, expanding upon them, discussing them, mentioning them. Now, if anyone gets offended by what I say, I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to apologize. I'm going to say here, right from the beginning, that what I am saying is based upon what Allah has said. And this is a very serious matter. And it's a, it's a matter to me and to every Muslim and to Allah, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, between truth and falsehood, between right and wrong, between success and failure. So we won't miss any bones. And I just hope, in the end, I just hope, that by the end of what I've said today, you might go away and you might think about what I've said. That something that I have said today will strike within you that, yes, that made sense. That made sense. Whatever I can say about it, it made sense. So what I want to start with is indeed the existence of Allah, the existence of the Creator of the heavens and the earth. Now we find it common amongst people today that they believe somehow that science has proved that God does not exist or something like this. Well, this is, uh, this is not true at all, actually. And you only have to read Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time, and he's supposed to be the Einstein of the age, the great scientist of the uh, decade, whatever, or the century, whatever, to find exactly that he makes no claims that science has proved anything at all. In fact, he begins his book by saying that science is merely to do with theories. A theory always remains a theory because tomorrow someone could come along and produce something which will prove that that theory was not a fact at all, it was just a theory. They'll prove it wrong. So it remains a theory. In fact, science isn't really qualified to say whether there is a God or not. Because science, by its nature, asks us to put aside our preconceptions, put aside our ideas, put aside our attitudes to the world and life around us and examine something as it is, so to speak. Examine this particular thing and this particular environment and this and that. Disconnect it from our world view, whatever. So really, the question of whether there is a God or not is not really actually within the realms of science. Not that science can't help, but it's not really within the realms of science. But the Quran uses something very simple. It says this to mankind. I'm just paraphrasing. It says to us, look at the sun. Look at the moon. Look at the alternation of the night and the day. Look at the stars, the way they are placed in the sky so that we can guide ourselves across the earth by means of them. Look at the ships which sail across the oceans for the benefit of mankind and the winds that blow them and bring the, the clouds and bring the rain and the crops which grow and the food that you eat and look within yourselves and look within the furthest horizon and in these things are signs which are clear for those who are wise, for those who contemplate, for those who have the ability to understand. In other words, the Creator is pointing to His creation as the proof of the reality of His existence and His power and His knowledge. He is pointing to creation and saying this is sufficient proof for anyone who has common sense. Why? Very simply because we as human beings understand naturally common sense. The way we see organization, there must be an organizer. The way we see things working in harmony according to a pattern, according to laws, things moving in a specific way, in a specific direction, for a specific time, we know from our everyday lives 
that there must be something that organizes it. Because we know, as human beings, that order never comes from chaos. Order is something imposed upon chaos. So therefore we found one of the early Muslim scholars when he was challenged by the atheists to prove to us that God exists. He made an agreement with them. He said, let me, reach you, let me meet you after the sunset prayer at the other side of such and such river at such and such time. And we were waiting for the scholar and the atheists. And they were waiting and they were waiting. And after some time, a long time, he still hadn't showed up. So when eventually he came, they were chastising him and saying, why were you so late and what happened to you and this and that. And he said, you know, the most amazing thing happened to me. I got to the river and I couldn't find any way to cross. So I was walking there and walking up and walking down and thinking, how am I going to get across the river? These people are waiting for me. And what am I going to do? So I sat down, scratching my head and scratching my beard or whatever. And thinking, how am I going to get across? And then suddenly, the tree fell down in front of me and divided itself up into planks. And out of the ground popped nails. And this boat started forming itself right in front of my eyes. So I got in the boat, and the boat carried me across the river, and that's how I got here. So he said, come on, you don't expect us to believe this nonsense? What the rubbish is this? He said, but why not? You asked me to expect to believe something even more incredible. That the heavens and the earth and all it contains is a product of chance and coincidence? So through a simple analogy, we understand that there is no possibility within the framework of our humanity to believe, even if we say we believe it, there is no possibility of its reality ever really being concrete in our mind. That this world in which we live is a product of chance and coincidence or some random forces. Rather, if we look at creation and we look at the things within creation and compare it to what we human beings have made with our intelligence and with our knowledge and with our ability, we find that creation is a much more perfect machine. It works much better than we do. Just look at our feeble attempts to dispose of our waste. Look at our feeble attempts to dispose of garbage. They have ships now sailing all around things, trying to get rid of the garbage that New York produces. They don't know what to do with it. So compare our attempts with all our toxic waste and our poisons and everything we're doing and how we're destroying ourselves and killing ourselves to the way it happens in nature. How the death of one thing becomes life for something else. This intricate, beautifully balanced, beautifully working, recycling, reprocessing, now how come this beautiful thing that works in nature so brilliantly is a product of chance that we with our intelligence, we can't produce something even anywhere near, near it? How is it that chance and matter, this is what we're talking about, matter and chance can produce life? How from this equation of matter and chance do you get life? Organized, working, functioning life. In fact, the reality is that if you were to leave a brick in your room, if you leave a brick in your room and it mutated the next morning into a motorbike, okay, the chances are more likely of the brick mutating to a motorbike overnight in your room than it is that matter evolved into life as we know it today. None of you would believe that even the simplest of objects that we use every day is a product of chance and coincidence. So how can we relate it to something clearly if you look at it? A more complex machines more fantastic in their working and their organization. I mean, for God's sake, take the camel and the car. Now this camel, it feeds itself. And wonders of all wonders, it produces more camels. It looks after itself, it wanders around, feeds itself, knows how to drink itself, knows how to do all these things, and it produces more camels. So compare it to what we drive around in this car. We have to put petrol in it, put oil in it, change this bit, change that bit. And does it reproduce itself? It doesn't. It has to be a big factory to make it all happen. So you don't have to see the manufacturer of the car to know the car's been manufactured. You don't have to see him, you don't have to see. You know that when you see this object, you know it had a manufacturer, you know it. That's why an archaeologist can go into the desert, dig in the desert and find a piece of pottery. And he can say, this piece of pottery is a conclusive proof, a conclusive proof of the existence of the people who made it. And not only does he finish that, he look at it and he say, and you know what? 
They have such and such level of technology. Why? Because this clay has to be baked at such and such high temperature in order for it to become like this. So we know that they used to know so much about ovens and temperature and these things. And look at the artwork and then they can tell you about how much they knew about art and paint and so many things from one piece of pottery. Even if it was in the middle of the desert and nothing was there, it's still a conclusive proof. So therefore, one leaf, one leaf, the simplest of objects in this earth is a conclusive proof of the existence of the one who made it and brought it into existence. It is a conclusive proof. And the reality is, as human beings, we can never really understand it any other way. We can never really understand it any other way, even if we claim that we do, even if we claim we don't believe there's a creator and this and that. It is against our basic human common sense and instinct and the way we perceive reality as human beings. So some researchers have not really been true to themselves. And the other proof that the Qur'an directs us towards as to the reality of the existence of Allah and also the falsehood of the other objects besides Him which we take for worship and I'll leave that at the end. I'll come back to this one. So now what I want to do is go through some of the false religions and the false gods that people worship. And I'm going to start with the worship of idols. How does Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, address this worship of idols? The people who worship bits of stone or wood or whatever, has God besides the one God? And the best example of this is in the story of Abraham. Ibrahim, Abraham, alayhi salam. Abraham himself was the son of an idol maker. He used to see his father make idols from wood and from stone and he used to see his father with the, state, with the same tree from which he cut the idol take the chippings and burn in the stove to warm himself up from the same tree, the same chippings so we find that he started now contemplating he started looking, he said this is unacceptable how could it one minute be a tree and the next minute be a god so he starts looking, he looks at the sun he looks at the moon, he looks at the stars, thinking, this is my God. No, this is my God, and maybe this is my God. But each one he finds, it comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. He realizes that each one is not independent. Each one is subjected to some laws, to some control. So therefore, no, this can't be my God. And then he prays, oh my God, if you don't guide me, I'm going to be lost. And then Allah, the Creator, he guided Abraham, alayhi salam. And Abraham began to preach to his people. Why don't you give up this worship of these false idols? You know they can't harm you, and they know they can't help you. So why are you so dedicated to them? Why do you worship them? Perhaps it's just because you like the admiration amongst yourselves. But this is futile, this is foolish. And he was a young man preaching this. And so no one listened to him, no one was listening. He's this fundamentalist, this fanatic person, preaching about one God, ignore him. So he got a bit frustrated one day. So when they were out on the religious festivities, he got an axe. He went into the temple and he smashed all of the idols, except one, except the biggest one, the main idol. And he took the axe and he put it round the biggest idol. He put the axe round the big idol. So when the people came back from their celebrations, they started saying, who did this to our idols, this blasphemy, this terrible thing? So Abraham, they said, they were saying, you know, it's Abraham, he was preaching about, you know, this is wrong and we should worship what the one God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So let, let's bring him. So they brought him and the king he questioned him. Did you do this to an idol to Abraham? And Abraham said, ask the big one. He said, ask the big one. And so when he said this to the people, the people were confounded. The people were confused. But they said, Abraham, you know this idol, they, they know they don't speak to us. So he said, so why do you worship them? Why do you worship them? And so through a simple way, Abraham showed to the people, how come you worship something and you ask of something this thing, which it can't even defend itself from being broken up, then how can it help you? If you were to take it and put it in the toilet, it couldn't help itself. So how is it going to help you? In fact, do you ask a blind man to lead you across the road? Do you ask someone who's in debt to lend you money? I mean, do you go to Brazil to borrow money? You don't go to Brazil to borrow. You don't go to someone who's crippled with debt and whatever and, tr and try and get finance from that. You go to Saudi Arabia. Some of that money, you know. 
The point is, why worship something which cannot help you and it cannot harm you? It's something they, okay, we may argue, but the people like it and they enjoy it and it gives them something in their life to do it, this and that. But in the end, they're doing something worthless. They're doing something which they cannot benefit from. They have a belief and a faith in something which is vain, which is false. And how can that ever benefit you? How can it benefit you to put your trust and your hope in something useless? How? And so this is where we find the drive again and again in the Qur'an. Why do you put your faith in something vain and useless? And it's upon this thing that Allah, He chastises the Jews. The Jews actually are the closest to the Muslims in their belief. In their basic, what we call Aqidah, the creed. In the monotheistic belief. The one thing that they have, which the Muslims well didn't have, but they do have it now, they definitely have it now, just the same, is that they have some inherent belief in their own natural good quality, i.e., I'm a Jew, therefore, or I'm a Muslim, that's the same now with the Muslims, I'm a Muslim, therefore, I'm guaranteed paradise, immediate ticket. It doesn't matter what I do, what I say, how I behave, in the end, I've got a ticket. Because my name is Mustafa, my name is Muhammad, I, I don't know, I don't care, I don't do anything, doesn't matter, I'm a Muslim. Just to say, the Jews were like this, and they're like this as well. And in fact, the Prophet Muhammad said the Muslims will follow the example of the Jews and the Christians and the Russians, step by step, stand by stand, how exactly we would follow them. But anyway, the Quran mentions this quality about them. Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, fear Allah. Don't be the first to reject this revelation and fear the day, the day of judgment. When no one will avail another, your birthright will not help you. You're belonging to the tribe of Israel, it will not benefit you. But there's this belief that people have that because I'm born of a certain woman who happens to be of a certain nation, therefore somehow I'm pure, I'm forgiven, I'm guaranteed paradise, goodness and truth is automatically in my heart. And this is something vain and this is something false. No one is going to be saved in this life or the next because they are born of a certain woman or belong to a certain race or belong to a certain type of people. No one is guaranteed anything. And so Allah says in the Quran, bring your proof. Bring your proof if what you say is true. Prove that Allah has said this, that the Creator of the heavens and the earth gave this guarantee. But rather, your salvation and success in this life and the next depends on your obeying your Creator and submitting yourself to His commands and following the religion that He has revealed. On this lies your salvation and your success. Not on your race, not on your tribe, not on your birthright. Sometimes this is common amongst human beings. It is a big problem amongst human beings. We find the Arabs have it, the British have it, you know, God is an Englishman type thing. Yes, stupid thing to say. But you know, I said that people say that. God is a nation, God is a Pakistan. Well, I, mean, I hope no Pakistanis say that, but you know. But how somehow you have some inherent quality because you're born of a certain nation. But this is something futile and this is something vain, detached from reality. You have a vain belief, you have a false hope, you put your trust, you rely on something which has no basis and no foundation in reality. So nationalism actually, and racism actually, is a form of making, worshipping a God besides the one true God. Thinking that this will give you what you want. But it won't. And then why? Because Allah points out and Allah explains what will happen to you. If what you say is true, then why did Allah punish you, O Bani Israel, for your sins? Why did He exile you? Why did He send you to Babylon? Why were your women raped, your cattle killed, your men murdered? Why was the land promised to you taken away from you? Because it was promised to you for all time on the condition that you worshipped Allah alone, you followed the prophets that came to you. That was the condition. And you didn't follow the condition and what happened? The same thing the prophets promised to you. Destruction. Misery. The curse of God and of all mankind. That was promised to anybody be he Jew or Muslim or Christian or whatever, who disobeys the commandments of God. So he says, if therefore what you say is true, then why did these things happen to you? Why did they happen to you? And the same thing, if it happens to you in this life, it's going to happen in the next. So you put your faith in something vain and something false. You worship something 
beside your creator which is not worthy of your worship not worthy of you worshiping and then we find as well that Allah the creator of the heavens and he takes to account the Christians the Christians have done something which also many many people have done they have taken a man and made him as God they have taken a man whom Allah has created and they have made him God as the Christians have done with Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary calling him Allah, calling him God, calling him one of three calling him a part of a trinity as the Hindus have done with Krishna, Rama as people have done with Buddha as even Muslims doing with Muhammad we find even this is happening now against all the clear guidance so we find this is something that men have done they have taken God's servant and God's creature and made him as God and this is something we should spend just a little bit of time examining because we have to ask ourselves when Allah says look at the heavens and look at the earth and look at this and look at that da 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 and these are clear signs the point is when we come back to this how do we know what is God and what is not God how do I know that I am not God and that God is, how do I know the tree is not God how do I know this cup is not God how do I know that the watch is not God how do I know this gentleman here is not God how do I know because God has certain attributes that belong to him and creation has certain attributes that belong to it for example God is eternal this is one of God's attributes one of his unique qualities he is eternal he is one he is alone huh? he has no beginning and no end he didn't begin a certain time and finish it a certain time he doesn't change, he's unchanging he doesn't go through different changes and changes personality and it's like no, he's the same God he was always and he always will be the same he doesn't need really anything he's self-sufficient this is one of the qualities that belong to God he is self-sufficient he doesn't have any needs at all it's one of his qualities and right, we all agree Muslims, Jews and Christians we all agree about this no, no one Muslim Jew or Christian I don't think will argue with me about any of these things that I said about what we agree about God amazing, we agree a lot actually we all agree that you can't see God you can't see, it's one of the qualities that God has He can't be seen, He's unseen so therefore let's examine it if you can see something, you know it's not God huh? if you know something had a beginning in time and an end in time you know it's not God if something was born and it died, you know it's not God if something had to eat and drink and breathe take in something in order to exist, I would have needs you know it's not God because God is self-sufficient So we know all these things about God, so I have to ask them. If we agree all these things about God, how did Jesus fit into those descriptions? He had a beginning, he had an end. He changed, he was a little baby, he grew up, he became a man. Everyone could see him. He needed to eat food in order to exist. In fact, when he wanted something and needed something, he used to ask God. So that there's not one description not one quality of God that belongs to Jesus or Buddha or Krishna or Rama or any of them rather they have all of them their qualities that belong to what is not God and when we look at Jesus or Krishna or anything or that tree we can look at it and we say this is a proof of God because we can look at it and we say well that's not him that needs him it needs something it must need God that's how we know how God exists so how then you say that a man is God or that this thing is God this man is the creator of the heavens and the earth so Allah says they are disbelievers who say Allah, the Jesus, the son of Mary is Allah they are disbelievers they do not believe in God the people who say that Jesus is Allah the creator of the heavens and the earth but it doesn't, the book doesn't stop there so to speak because when you confront some Christians with this they'll say no, this, we don't believe Jesus is God and many Christians they say this now but we believe he is the son of God but this is the same thing if you think about it, and the early theologians in the church, they used to argue this. They used to say, the son is like the father. I, your son is like you. You are a man and your son is a man. It's very important actually to remember this. Your son is like you. 
Therefore, if Jesus was the Son of God, he must have been God like his Father. It's an argument, twisted logic. Not starting from A, but starting from the wrong direction. So what we find is, Allah in the Quran says, that those who say Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, has begotten a son, put forth a thing most monstrous, most monstrous, that the sky is ready to rent asunder, the earth is ready to break open, and the mountains ready to fall in a ruin because they attribute a son to Allah, the merciful one, Allah. This is the calamity of saying Allah has a son. And the Prophet Muhammad says that Allah has said, the son of man has insulted me and he had no right to do so. And the son of man has denied me and he had no right to do so. As for his insulting me, that is his son. Of a sexual act. The product of a sexual act. So we find Allah in the Quran says, if Allah has a son, who is his wife? Who is his consort? And if you're saying that God has a son, you're saying God is a fornicator. You're saying God is a fornicator. What are you attributing to the creator of the heavens and the earth? What are you attributing to him? If you think about it, they'll confront some Christian with this and they'll say, no, no, we don't mean that. We don't mean God actually, you know, copulated. Because they realize this is something that, that God is above such things. But that's what you mean when you say forgotten, that's what it means. That's what the word means. Look at it in the dictionary. So he said, no, 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 symbolic. He's symbolic that God has adopted us as his children. But this is also insulting God. And I'll tell you why. Quite simply. Allah says in the Quran, if we wish to adopt something as our son, we would have chosen something nearer to us. Something nearer to us. Like something nearer in might and power and wisdom and intelligence and beauty. Something much nearer. But why? Because look, if I put a mouse here today, and I put it in the cage, I said, this mouse is my son. This mouse here is my son. You all go, come on. It's not your son, it's a mouse. So no, no, it's my son. He eats with me at the table. He has a room in my house. The adoption papers are coming through next week. He's enrolled at university and college. He's my son. And you say, he's not your son, it's the mouse. The man is the man and the mouse is the mouse. How can the mouse be your son? Because it's something foolish. It doesn't mean anything. You only adopt something as your son which is like you. So therefore, are we not closer to the mouse than we are to Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth? In our knowledge, beauty, power, wisdom, or a lack of it, we are closer to the mouth than we are to our Creator. The difference between us and God, so then what are you accusing your Creator of? Of adopting you, me, as his child? What a foolish thing! What a nonsensical, meaningless thing! We are not at all like him, not vaguely. That's why you get insulted if someone calls you, you son of a dog, you son of a cow. Why do you get insulted? Why do you say your daughter's a cow? Your husband's a snake? Why? Why? You know, your boyfriend's a hippopotamus, okay? Why? Because, see, a girlfriend is what I mean. Why? Because why? Why are you associated man with something considered lesser than man? It's a way of insulting someone. So what do you do? What do you think you're saying when you say, I am the son of God, or we are the children of God, or God has a son? It's an insult. Because God is pure, He is holy, He is wise beyond all wisdom, He is powerful beyond what we can imagine power is. That is His greatness. His supremeness. He is holy. He is pure, free from fault and blemish. Then we sin by day and we sin by night. So what is this saying? No. Uh, and, and it is something futile. It is something again futile. You have given yourself a quality that does not belong to you. You have based your view of life and reality on something that is not real. You have an opinion of yourself that doesn't exist. How will that help you in life? How will it help you in life? Rather, the way to get by, the way to understand, the way to succeed in this life and the next is to recognize your true position. And our true position, this of this, our Creator, is that we are His creatures and His slaves and His servants, His property. He does with us what He wills. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi said, Don't exaggerate about me as the Christians did with Jesus. I am the creature of God. 
his slave and his messenger are no more than that. This is what he said. I am the creature of God, his slave and his messenger are no more than that. So, we find this is something the pagans used to say, the pharaohs used to say, the Roman emperors used to say that they are the sons of God and his chosen ones. This is what they used to say. We are the sons of God and his chosen ones. And as Allah says in the Quran, if you are the sons of God, to make you think, if you are truly the sons of God, why does he punish you for your sins? Because if you are God's sons, you must be like him, therefore you must be perfect like him, sinless, so then why does he punish you? Why does he punish you for your sins? If you are the children of God. If we are the children of God. No, we are not such things. And to believe it will make a mess of your life. And even more a mess of your next life. So now I want to finish off with one final false god. And this final false god takes in so many others. But really it is the worship of the world and the things of the world. The belief in power, in wealth, in money, in fame, in technology. This self conceited arrogant belief that we have here in the West so strongly. We have beautiful buildings, tall buildings, amazing tanks, weapons of destruction. We can send rockets to the moon. Look at our power. Look at our might. Look how strong we are. And this belief makes people think that they will last forever. It makes people think that they will last forever. And it's not a new thing. So believe the people of the past. So believe Pharaoh and his people. When Moses, when Allah sent Moses to Pharaoh to call Pharaoh to worship Allah alone, Pharaoh said, I am God. Do you have a God besides me? He said, I am God. Do you have a God besides me? This is what he said. And he believed he would last forever. And they even had all these pyramids and these tombs and mummification and all the book of death and all this magic and all this thing because they thought this was going to make them last forever. They thought their knowledge and their wealth and their power would make them last forever and give them eternal life. So are deluded the people of wealth and power. And so we find today the same thing. In America now, what they do is when they get old and they get a bit, they get some disease, they have the doctor chop their head off and have it frozen in a special liquid so that one day they can be brought back to life when science has reached this stage. And there was this program just the other week called The Trouble with Medicine. It was talking about how in America they spend, what is it, 75% of the health budget in the last two months of people li- people's lives, basically just trying to keep people alive for a month or two longer. And the thing that you found about this, you watch this program is, that the people really thought, they, they never thought they were going to die. They didn't think they were going to die. It never crossed their mind that they were 80 years old and it never crossed their mind that they were going to die. Because people, they really think they're going to love, and you find people saying, yes, death will come to you. Even the people who recognize death exists, they say, I'll die sometime. Not tomorrow, not now, not maybe the next instant, but sometime. But Allah says in the Quran to these people who put their faith in these things, the power and the technology and all of it, and they think it will make them last forever, and it makes them so arrogant. And they walk across the earth so arrogantly, strutting and striving, lords of good fortune, oppressing, destroying, all in the name of democracy or freedom or whatever it may be. They do it in the name of. But in the end, it's just for the sake of their God, power and wealth. They build a man up, Saddam was saying one day, they give him weapons, they give him money, they give him technology. They even give the desert fatigues of their own army, like the British army did. Saddam Hussein was dressed in the, British, the desert fatigues of the British army. Give it to him, sell it to him. And the next day, they crush him. Because he gets in the way of their worship of their God's money and power. Nothing to do with justice and peace and this thing, no. He was killing his people and murdering people for 12 years. What happened to justice and truth and democracy then? It was just rolled out for convenience sake at that time. No, let's get it right. The God is money and power. The religion is the consumer society. Don't worry about this next life nonsense, God nonsense. You've got one life here on earth. Have fun. Enjoy yourself. Have a good time. Smoke this. Drink that. Dance to this. Watch that. Here, make your paradise here, it tells you. So Allah says, travel the earth. Look. Look at the ruins. Go to Rome. 
go on, go on, she just go and look at the, the, what do you call it, the, I can't remember its name, the thing when you have the, 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 the gladiators in the Colosseum. Go and look. Bread and circuses. Half the world was under the control of the Roman Empire. What's now? What's that? The Egyptians, the Ephesians, the Carthaginians. How many civilizations they've come and they've gone. And most of them disbelieved in Allah. Most of them put their faith in things other than Allah. Most of them thought they would last forever. And ones you never even heard of. Unless you study ancient history, the Chaldeans, the Akkadians. People used to study Chaldean all across the earth. From North Africa almost to China. They would study Chaldean, a bit like English now. What is it left? Does anyone know some Chaldean here? You probably don't even know, never heard of it. If they thought they were going to last forever. And if Allah was to send an earthquake, like He did, like He destroyed people, the Had and the Thamud, just one shot and they were prostrated in their homes. Finished, gone, everything. Finished. The Thamud, for seven days and seven nights, the storm raged. For seven days and seven nights, and you would have found them prostrate in their homes. Finished, all of it. And how they put their faith in their big buildings and their beautiful structures. How Allah opened the seas and destroyed the army of Pharaoh, like that. Plague after plague, he decimated them, the people of Egypt. Again and again and again. And they had armies and they had technology. You know we couldn't build a pyramid. We don't know how to build a pyramid today. We don't if we wanted to. We don't know how to do it. We haven't got the technology. We haven't got the means. And Allah says, they're greater than you in wealth and power. And the remains they left are more than what you've left. More was left. So why do you put your faith in something vain and something false? Why do you put your faith in a power that comes and goes? Why do you think something will make you last forever? It will not make you last forever. And what do you do? You deny your Creator, you deny His prophets, you deny His revelations. And the real reality to come, the reality of the Day of Judgment, the day of 50,000 years for the unbelievers, one day of 50,000 years, and the terror of that day is such, my people, the terror of the day is such that the hair of the children will turn grey with terror. That the woman who is bearing a child, she will miscarry through fear. And mankind will be running as a drunken riot, but they won't be drunk. A day when we'll be up to our necks and our waist and our noses and our thing in sweat. Because of the fear, because of the panic. Naked, but not noticing the nakedness, you'll be naked alone. No government to back you. No F-16 fighters to support you. No money, no music, nothing. Just you and your deeds. Just you and your deeds. That's all you'll have. That's reality. That's the real reality that's going to come. That's a day promised by the one who brought you into existence. Your creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it doesn't finish there. Because there's the hellfire and there's the paradise. And you want to tell me they don't exist? You want to tell me it's a thing? I ask you, prove to me it doesn't exist. Did you travel? through the furthest horizon, through every dimension, to tell me you never saw it? How do you know it doesn't exist? How do you know that when you die, the angels will come to you and sit you up in your grave and they will question you? Who was your Lord? What was your religion? What did you know about this man, Muhammad? How do you know it won't happen? How do you know that your grave won't crush you? And that you won't be tormented in it? Smelling the flames from the hellfire or gathering the perfumes from paradise. How do you know? Do you have some knowledge? Have you been there? Are you so sure? Are you ready for it? And what are you going to say to me? Well, I'll find out when I get there. So some people say, I'll find out. Yes, you'll definitely find out when you get there. It'll be too late. Because there's no going back. And how many people on the Day of Judgment, they will say, Oh my God, send me back. Allah, send me back. I'll be good. I'll be pious. Send me back. Who is the one on that day when you see the hellfire? Clear. And this hellfire, what is this hellfire? You want to imagine the size if you can imagine. When the Prophet Muhammad saw the angel Gabriel, he filled the horizon. He filled the horizon. When the Prophet Muhammad, when he first saw the angel Gabriel, when he came to bring it, he filled the horizon. The hellfire has 70,000 bridles, each one pulled by 70,000 angels. Imagine the size, and it will be filled. This is a place where Allah says, he will roast the skins and recreate the skins and re roast the skins so they may taste the torment. This is just a, a little imagining of the beginning of it. And the paradise, what bliss lies there, what happiness, what pleasure. This is the reality. This is the reality I know about. 
I know it exists, I know it's there. But you tell me it's not there, but how do you know? Are you so sure? And when you see it, when you see it, how you will, are you going to think now? When you see that, who are you going to call to then? Who are you going to call upon then? Who are you going to plead to then? Who are you going to supplicate to then? Who are you going to devote and, and just wish and pray and make all your efforts for then? Who will it be? Will it be your friends? Will it be your mother? Will it be your father? Will it be your entertainment you had in the life? Who will you be calling to on that day? Whose help will you be seeking on that day? And by way, my people, of a case of this in the life. But ask yourself, think about it, read about it. You know when it comes, you're on the ship, and you're out at sea, and the waves get bigger and bigger, and they get stormier and stormier, and that's it, you think you're finished, you've gone. You know like when you drop something hot, you, when you pick something hot, you drop it, you don't think about it, it's not something, it's an intellectual process, I have picked something hot, let me drop it, no, you do it instinctively, because it's your nature, it's programmed into you. The same thing, when that moment comes, whether you're on the sea, or you're flying in an aeroplane and the wings start burning and the aeroplane starts plunging, or you're trapped somewhere and you think there's no way out, when all these things come to you, who is it you call to? Who is it you call to supplicate to? Who is it you make your religion and your faith and everything to? You make it sure to Allah. You may not know His name is Allah. You may call Him God. You may call Him whatever. But in your heart you are calling out to that one being who you know has power over everything. Instinctively within yourself. Instinctively. Another proof and a sure proof of the reality of the existence of your Creator. He is the one you are called. So why, my people, don't you make your religion and your faith pure to Him? Because in the end, if you want peace, and you want tranquility, and you want happiness, and you want success in this life and the next, Allah has power over all things, and everything is in His hands. And he is the one who is only worthy of worship. Zakalah khair. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdi ka shadu Allah ilaha 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 Questions can be about anything, anything to do with Islam, anything to do with what we've heard, please, uh, please ask. Yeah, it's about the gentleman brother mentioned that Muslims have taught, started to take Muhammad as God. And can I give some examples? What I mean is, and we should understand this is very important. For example, I don't have to stand here and say I'm God to claim to be God. For example, if I sit here and I say I know everything and there's nothing that I don't know, I don't have to say I'm God. I've already claimed for myself something that belongs to Him. If I can tell you I know everything that will happen in the future, I don't have to say I'm God because I claim for myself something that only belongs to Him. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's coming now, okay? So look, you don't have to say Muhammad is God, but you could give him one of the qualities that only belongs to God. For example, you could pray to him. You could go to his grave and you could pray to him and say, Oh Muhammad, do this for me and do that for me and whatever. Now you have given to him a quality and a right and a worship that only belongs to God. You see? Just like an idol worshipper would go to an idol and say, Oh, idol, help me, and oh, idol, do this for me, and oh, idol, do that for me. Because Allah has not given Muhammad the power in his grave to answer your prayers or to help you because he's dead. Okay? Now, if you believe that the Prophet Muhammad can help you, or any Prophet Abraham, Jesus, Moses, whatever, same as Jesus, praying to them instead of to God, supplicating to them instead of to God, you've made that being, that Prophet, that state, whatever, as an object of worship besides the one true object of worship. You do something vain, you do something false, you made a God besides God. You see? So this is an example. So some people say, for example, that Muhammad is everywhere. You know? Well, he's everywhere. And they pray to him. And so they make a circle, some of them, and they leave a place, 
for Muhammad to come. And not just like this. So we find that these are some of the ways where people are starting now to honor the Prophet Muhammad above what Allah gave him, the qualities Allah gave him. Giving him qualities and attributes that he never had. Saying he was made from the light of the arsh of Allah and these things and the first thing Allah created was his, his, you know, his light and from the light Muhammad was created and these things. Which all was putting in a station about what he was. Where he said, I am the creature and the slave of Allah and his prophet. So don't call me any more than that. Okay? So this is an example. How these things can start. They may seem innocent at first, but it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's how Jesus came to be worshipped as Allah. Through this process of exaggeration. I'd like to say something, inshallah, before we all go. There's um, Quran for sale. I hate to say for sale at the back, but it's only four pounds. And alhamdulillah, it's really, you know, I don't think they're even going to get the money back from what they made to print it with. Because it's a nice Quran, hardback and everything. I really do recommend that you uh, read it or, and buy it if you can afford it. I'm sure if you can't afford it really, then the brothers will give it to you free. The other thing I'd like to say is please take a look around the Islamic exhibition. And especially I'd like you to look at the bit about the scientific things in the Qur'an. The scientific things in the Qur'an. Because what I, if I had more time and whatever, and I prepared myself properly, this is something I would have gone into. Because just to mention very briefly, it should be fair and just for you to say, well, yes, you gave a very nice talk and it was full of whatever, but you prove it now. You prove it. You said to us, prove it, prove it. Now you prove that what you're saying is true. And indeed, every prophet came with a convincing miracle. Every prophet came with a convincing miracle. Moses, he came at a time when the people, the Egyptians, were well practiced in the magic, magical arts. And Allah gave him a miracle. He threw down the, the stick and it turned into a serpent. It was a miracle. A clear miracle that they knew, the magicians, when they saw it, this was from God. This was not magic. And so the magicians themselves became worshippers of the one true God. And Jesus, he came at a time when the people were very proud of their medical knowledge and their medical ability. And so Allah gave him the miracle of healing the sick, raising the dead, curing the lepers, etc. etc. And Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa the last prophet, he came initially to the Arabs. Although he was a messenger to all mankind, initially he was sent to the Arabs. And for them, their pride was in their language. Their pride was in their language. They had great pride. They used to be able, many of them, to stand up and recite poetry just like this. And they had great pride and great love of their language. So the challenge the Qur'an made to the Arabs was that if you believe that this book is from anyone else than Allah, bring one chapter like it. One chapter like it. The smallest chapter of the Qur'an is إِنَّا أَعْتَيْنَكَ الْكَوْثَرْ فَاسْتَلِّي لِرَبِكَ وَنْحَرْ إِنَّا شَنِيَكَ هُوَ الْأَبْتَرْ The smallest three lines of the Qur'an. And the Qur'an challenged the Arabs to produce one chapter like it, these three lines. Both in its meaning, and its content, and its laws, and everything. And it's, of course its language and its beauty. And none of them ever did it. They fought the Prophet Muhammad, they fought wars with him, battled with him, tortured his followers, boycotted him, all sorts of things. They did. But not one of them was able to produce the light of the Qur'an. Surely they would have done that, rather than lose so many people and lose so much money and time and everything. But they could never do it. But of course, to most of us, this doesn't mean anything. We don't speak Arabic. We're not Arabs. We don't have this pride in the tongue. We don't understand Arabic. And isn't Islam, you claim, you might take me, a religion for all time and all people. That's what you claim. So what's the miracle for us today? What is the miraculous quality of the Qur'an that is the clear proof and the convincing sign that, that this is from Allah? Yes, what you say is convincing about the oneness of God and everything, but let's look at your revelation. What is the convincing proof? And I would say to you, you must look at the scientific, the things that the Qur'an mentions about the creation of the heavens and the earth, about the human beings, about the, the, the things that we observe scientifically and that we know about from science today. And compare it, for example, what is contained within the biblical scriptures or the Buddhist or the Hindu scriptures or whatever. Compare what is in the Qur'an, which was, which compared to the knowledge of the people at the time. 
And there's a section actually which goes in the middle of the room here when this is over and everything. I ask you to come and look at that section. And there's also a video, it's a very long video, I don't expect too many people will have patience to sit through it, but if you really want to find out, you sit, sit and watch this video by Sheikh Zandani, inshallah, Hassan will put it on for you if anyone wants it. He is discussing these miraculous scientific statements within the Qur'an and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. And this is enough of a convincing proof for anybody in this university today. And I challenge anyone to bring me a convincing explanation from how the Prophet Muhammad, a man living 1,400 years ago in the desert, who was not a learned man who could either read or write, how he knew things which scientists have only discovered within the last 30 years. It's not my saying, that's the saying of Keith Moore. And if you don't ask, I'm sure if you've got a biology department or something, one of the standard textbooks that they study, okay, is The Developing Human by Keith Moore. This is what he said. Most Bukhair are scientists, and many other scientists examining the scientific statements in the Qur'an have found them of such an astounding, accurate nature that they cannot find an explanation for it except that this must be a revelation from God. So that's my challenge to you. Go, find out, look for yourself, and see for yourself. And don't just take what I said today, think about it, search about it, search for the truth. Inshallah, and may Allah guide us all closer to the truth. Jazakallah khair. There's no more questions on the Who knows us, who creates us, who knows 
by nature, who knows what is good for us and what's bad for us. He knows what is good and what is evil. He knows what is right and what is wrong. Because he is the one who will reward. He is the one who will punish. He is the one who will give success or failure in this life or the next. So the whole criteria is in his hands. It is in his hands. So when you understand this, you have to understand this. By what right do you tell me that we are wrong? By what right? By the way, you sent a man to the moon? Is that right? Because I don't see peace on the streets. I don't see, I don't see people living in happiness. Rather, I see crime and rape. I see a world where a woman takes her job for a woman with her three-year-old son. She is brutally sad and raped. With her three-year-old son found money, money set up. That's what I see. I see a society where a woman comes running naked and bleeding into the street in a rush hour in New York. Help me, help me, and I raped. And no one's got to help her. No one stops to help her. And a man comes and drags her back into the house, where I scream to the curb, and no one stops to help her. That's what I see. Well, by what right? By what right do you define for us how we should live, by what rules we should judge? And just open your own books and read your own rules, and you'll find them. The death of treason, the punishment of treason in this country is death by hanging. The punishment for treason in this country is death by pain. The present day goes to Not only the person who commits treason, but anyone who aims for a best, someone who commits treason. And not only are you allowed to kill in this country, but you can take him anywhere in the world by your own But we, our kids, is not some human being who lives in a palace. Who is going to die one day, and who is going to be overtaken by a fornicator the so-called head of the church of England, the head of the church, the head of Christianity in England, is a boy. This is not our king. This is not our ruler, our ruler, our ruler, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the king of heaven we are, the pure, the holy, the divine. So blasphemy against him is treason against him. Apostasy from Islam is treason against him. Why should we treat him like this? Why should we treat him as a real consequence? It's not only for us, but for all of mankind, there is an empire. And the Lord don't desire that for people, not anybody. I think Khomeini said this thing, if he said it, if he said it, if he really said this, I think he did. If he really said that we don't care if we're going to come to those highest man, we were sent to hell, this is not the belief of any Muslim. Not any Muslim would say this. Rather, we hope and wish that the Rashid would repent from his evil. And then he will become the most pious man. And inshallah, God willing, we will treat him as the most pious man amongst us. We don't want him to go to hell. Indeed, that is our purpose, what we're striving for, what I'm sitting with here for, to worship Allah and to call you away from the fire. As the Prophet Muhammad said, I'm like a man, we're like a man that is right in the fire. And you're like the rocks, coming into the fire, and I'm trying to grab you and stop you from it. That's what the prophet said, he was lying to the people. I'm trying to grab you by the shirt and stop the devil's supply. That's all I'm trying to do. That's all what you should be trying to do. We're trying to stop the people who go to the fire. Because the reality is there, it's waiting in the And that's all I can say by way of justification.
You say we're primitive and we jump off the hands of the teacher. What do you do? Let me ask you. With your so-called great science and technology and your wisdom. You know what you do? You put the guy in prison. So what happens to 90% of the people that are going to prison? They say, oh, I'm, I feel really bad and I just have done this. No. They sit down together. This one, that one, John Fox, this, Raji and Mohammed, they sit down and have a good talk. You know, next time you do your job, okay, do it at this time of the day, not that time of the day. And this is how to keep the law. And this is how to break it. And this is how to avoid the police. And this is how the university to teach these and murder the rapists how to better things than murder the rapists. They go in there and they get more educated in their crime, they get more educated in the injustice that they're doing. So when it comes for them to come out, what's in their minds? I'm going to stop this, I'm going straight. No. It's in their minds, I'm going to keep doing it, but I'll do it better next time and I won't get caught. That's why we find the reality that the crime rate is rising day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, and people can and cannot be controlled. You can't. Why? It's your own man of thing. From your own design, this is wisdom either. What do you know? You don't even know how my, a person's mind works. You don't know how someone's mind works. You don't know what's going to stop from stealing or what's not going to stop from stealing. You don't know how people work. Because we're so little. We are so little. But I tell you, I've been to a country. I have been to a country <coughs> where, and I've been, I've seen this myself, when the man who calls the people to prayer, the shopkeeper, he takes the clock, he puts it on in his foot, and he goes and prays and he comes back. Any Muslim here who's been to Mecca or Medina or rather Medina, they'll see this happen with the tears of their own eyes. So we find that coming to God, our religion punishes the guilty and protects the innocent. It works. Whereas your way, what do you call it compassion? Is compassion punishing the innocent people? Is that compassion? The way your crime is escalating and escalating, is that compassion? Is it justice? Is it right? So how about on bigger things? How about on things bigger than that? How about war? When you go to war, for what do you fight? Who do you kill? Why do you kill? You tell me. Why people are starting today in Somalia and Ethiopia? You don't even have to go and fight because you're already killing them with your banks and your homes. And Jesus pray that they can't pay back. And your IMF, they go up and they say, yes, we'll lend you some money. And with this money we lend you, why don't you grow some cash crops so you can pay us back? Some people grow cash crops. Many they used to grow the food to feed their people with, they now grow cash crops. But what the island doesn't tell them is they told everyone else to grow the same crop. So when the season comes, the crop comes, the market is flooded, the people make no money at all because it's not worth anything, and the land they used to grow their food they have now a useless cash crop, and they have no food, and the people are starving, and the children are dying, and the babies are crying. So who comes along? Who happens to have some surplus grain mountains and beet mountains and milk? Makes. The same people who get the money. The same people who rule all the purpose, manipulating these people. Stop them, kill them, murder them for the sake of what? For a few more pounds of zeros on their computer bank And you want to talk to me about jihad? Don't have some gloves on and rush about Nagasaki with it. The Muslims, if we build that, they will rush about Nagasaki with it. 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 They will rush about Nagasaki where is good and where is evil? Where is right and where is wrong? Who defines it? Do you define it? Do I define it? Does Bush define it? Does Tash define it? But for me, Alhamdulillah, my creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he defines it for me. And for every true Muslim, every true Muslim. And that's what I want to say about you. Kuwait is giving their lives and they're not giving Kuwaiti citizenship. 
and they treat it like nothing, it's like stuff. So, I'm not going to say the solution lies in the Muslim world, look at the Muslims. Yeah? Here, we're so good. No, I'm not saying that. I'm quite looking at it. I say, look at the punishment that Allah is delivering upon us. We are the ones, He's humiliating us like no other people. Why? For the same reason that happens to the other people. We have left this religion. We have left judging by the criteria that the Creator has revealed. Okay? The solution is a solution that has worked. I'm not offering you pipe dreams. I'm not saying, you know, a pipe dream. I'm not offering you a philosophy or a theory like communism or Marxism that has never been working, actually worked in reality. I'm not offering you that. I'm offering something. And I'm telling you about something which you can see historically. Historically, you can go back and you can see it has worked and it has succeeded. It's a social thing, it's a political thing, it's an economic thing. Yes. Yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah. But it makes good difference. Very good difference. But it, unless, unless the actual government itself changed. Yeah. It wouldn't make, I mean, it's still making the Muslim, but it's still kept on ruling by the same laws and governing by the same thing. There is, an, there is an Islamic political, social, and economic system. Go into it would be a thing, okay, long term. Okay. You can read it in the Quran, you can, there's probably a book there about political systems in Islam, economic systems in Islam, and this and that, okay? But essentially, you know, essentially, yes, we seek this, and we hope for it, and we want it.